Book group with Mary. Through the Mists by Robert James Lees. This is session 2 of chapter 11, 26 of September 2012, Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. Welcome everyone to chapter 11, part 2 of our discussion of Through the Mists. How's your week been? Or your nearly week been since we met last? Great. Better. Better? Mm. That's good. That's good, Alexis. You're feeling a bit low, hey? Yeah. All over the place. All over the place, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, how'd you go with your homework questions? Does anyone remember the questions I asked right at the end? I tagged them right. Eloisa? Matt, if you just pass back to. Uh, we were discussing, we were about midway through the chapter and we were discussing the statement by Kushner. Um, Fred had just asked him, so out of all the religions on earth, who gets saved the most, basically? And Kushner um, made this beautiful statement about love that I also referenced in the talk on Saturday. Um, and so I asked some questions springing from that. And Louisa, do you remember that? Um, the first one was, how does the one true religion affect my life? Uh -huh. Two was how does it relate to the truth I've already heard, or how do I apply this to my life? Yeah. Um, three, how I would fare if I entered the spirit world now, and four, how many excuses I'm making to avoid the one true religion. I think that was all you had. Yeah, yeah. So, do you guys feel up to discussing some of those things? Yeah, awesome. Can we start with the first question, which I think I kind of rephrased a little bit in my own um, notes to make it a bit clearer. Um, it was about how does this how does this relate to divine truth? And I was speaking to Eloise and she was like, what, do you, what does that mean? That's pretty vague. So I think I rephrased it to, do you think that, uh, what do you think about this statement? Do you think it's in harmony with what you've learnt about divine truth from Jesus? This idea that love is the one true religion. Yeah. Okay, what do you, what do you feel about all of it? And how did you, what, how did you respond to how it relates? Pete? Just after the last week we've had, um, my self-reflection was on if I just loved the environment and the animals in my care, then how would have that actually looked relative to what I have done in the past? Yeah. So it started to bring up all that self-reflection of, okay, well, this is what I've done, but if I'd actually, if love had been my mission here, then yeah. how would things have looked? And it would have looked very different. Yeah, so it would look different, you reckon? Well, there's so many decisions that were made with fear and, and not love being the key. So, um, yeah, I just felt there was a lot of repentance and also the driving of um, having money and, yeah, buying things and all those sort of things. It's like if I just thought about love, yep. then there would have been a lot of decisions that I would have made that wouldn't have been related to money or fear of or lack of. Yep. I would have just gone with the desire. Yeah, awesome. So you realise that if, if you'd recognised this love factor, you would have been giving a lot more than you would have been taking. There's so many decisions yeah. that I just wouldn't have taken. Yep. And they were taken, you know, out of this, you know, yeah, wanting and taking from rather than giving to. Yeah. And that's awesome. really been highlighted in the last week. Awesome. Eloisa, yeah? Um, I really liked the first question, like how does it affect my life and I went into all these things and then I like was reviewing it and I was like actually it, the one true religion affects all of our lives all of the time, every single moment whether or not we're aware of it yeah. and it's sort of like I can, once you know that then you can start maybe acting in harmony with it but there's all these laws that I don't even understand and I don't even know are even working um, and yet they're all working. Yeah. And, you know, I've always, I suppose, put it as, oh, coincidence or whatever, or, oh, that's nice. And now it's like, well, actually, you've got some say in that. And, yeah. and that's quite a, um, I like that feeling, you know. So that if you understand the law, if you understand the law of love, then you actually have more of an insight into what's happening around you. Is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, well, you get a bit of a choice, you know. And, yes. and, and, and it's also... Things can be consistent and they can be, like, really nice, you know, and you don't have to just, like, make them really nice all the time. Like, it cuts out a lot of the exhaustive yeah. trying. 
Can you give us an example of what you mean? Um, <laughs> That's yeah. putting you on the spot, I know, but... Yeah, um, oh, heaps of examples. Um, let me think about it. Like, say, with the kids, um, trying and trying and trying to be this, this great mum, yeah. you know, and I don't feel like I'm a great mum on any level. And it's like when I give up and I just surrender to the fact that I don't feel that way, it, it's like every... Like, generally, I have 25 kids, you know, not just three. Because <laughs> of all the spirits yeah, involved. Because of all yeah. the spirits <laughs> who I choose to allow in as well. Yeah. Through my things. And it's like when I actually just surrender to the fact that I just feel like I can't cope. Yeah. Um, it just all, all, all goes. And there's three little darlings who are doing their own thing and I'm left on my own wondering what I should do now. <laughs> and, and it's sort of like the stress is out and there's no, you know, like I, I don't have to try and be good. You know, I've just got to realise I don't feel that way. And then things just will sort of work themselves out. Yeah. I'm not sure that's a great example. but So you're talking about the fact that when you're in your self-reliance, you're trying to make everything work and trying to control everything. And when you surrender your desire for control and just allow yourself to feel, yeah, then things become much clearer. Yeah. And how do you think that relates to love? Hmm. Well, I think I'm loving myself and I'm loving them at the same time because I'm not like oozing all the crap that generally comes out of me in those moments, you know, onto them and the demands so, go down. So by making the decision to actually feel yourself, yeah, that's more loving, yeah? I reckon. And what's the dominant emotion when you're trying to control everything? Fear. Yeah. Just total fear. Yeah. And every time I'm in fear, which is a lot, mm -hmm. and I'm, I, I don't think I've been very open to how much, and I don't think I'm fully open to exactly how much, but... Um, yeah, when you're in fear, everything works against you. Everything. Yeah. We had this lovely little experience today when Charlie brought us a lizard uh -huh. that was a brown snake. And um, <laughs> <laughs> in the way that he brings and you we're everything. Like, we're like, wow, it's a lizard. And so it's fine. And then suddenly he gets in, we're like, it's a snake. And he just drops it. And the little snake's like, <laughs> oh, wow. Because of our fear. Yeah. And then we were like, you know, and, then, and then, then we like sort of owned it. And the little snake did its little thing. And then. We were fearful again, and it's hissing at us. And wow. Yeah, it was real freaky. But yeah. I was like, well, you know, you can see it in everything that you do. And imagine if you, like, the lizards don't freak out and try <laughs> to start defending themselves, do they? Because you're not afraid. So imagine if you went, oh, Charlie, that's a snake. Awesome. Let's let him go free. He probably would have just gone free. Totally. Yeah. But it's the, you know, the words we were going, oh, that's really great. But inside, <laughs> we're like, oh. <laughs> We're freaking out. Wow. Wow. That's pretty intense, hey? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. If we pass forward to Matt, had his hand up about your art, how it relates to your life. Did you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, Don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I've, I've been looking that like my life's been about a religion of fear, mm -hmm. not a religion of love. And um, that, um, like, I guess what I've been noticing myself doing as I'm reading this book is going, oh, I'm like Marie, and you know, lots of error inside of me, and pretty fear driven, and not wanting to be myself and stuff, but like what Divine Truth is giving me the opportunity for is actually to make some changes. If yeah. I really want like to actually start to act differently. And I think that's something I noticed with where the Divine Truth that I think you were asking before is like um, this religion of love. Yeah. In that I watch, for instance, AJ act and I think probably much more than what he talks about is what he does yes as yeah. demonstrating that love and being like well even if I'm in a lot of error in whatever way I can like God keeps giving me opportunities all the way throughout the day to actually choose love as my religion yeah yeah awesome awesome so both you and Eloisa are seeing there's a choice that you can make choosing yeah. fear or choosing this 
this, hum this basically humility, but through Eloise's demonstration, you can see that it's actually a loving choice, humility, can't you? You know, we yeah. often talk about humility as the gateway to truth, as the gateway to love in terms of a relationship with God. But you can actually see in her example when she's trying to control the kids in all this fear, and then she drops it and just decides to feel herself that she's actually made a choice for love. So in that way, humility is really loving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we pass back to Yvonne. Yeah, this was just this one paragraph was quite a journey uh -huh. of days of reflection. Um, and I looked at it all and thought, well, yes, I, I believe and agree with those tenets. So, and I'll do some of them some of the time. But what's stopping me from doing them all of the time? Awesome, yeah. And... Um, and I realised I have a very selective order of love. Mm -hmm. Like there's a small group up there who just give me love and truth. And then there's the group who um, I'm in codependence with. I'll meet their addictions and they'll meet mine. Yeah. All yeah. my old friends. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a group of um, similar injuries and we can just hang out and commiserate. And pretty much everybody else, it's like, well, they're angry or they're demanding or they're this or they're that. It's, there's a judgment in... Yeah. categorising them and, and realise that um, I'll stay away from those people and just stay with these people, all because of humility, all because of lack of humility that um, in every case it's I don't want to feel how they make me feel. Yeah. And, it's, and, and then I looked at all the ways I avoid humility and I, I found that I had to kind of redefine it like, okay, humility is being willing to feel everything but humility is not using any means to avoid feeling what's in there. And so awesome. it helped me yeah. start to understand humility really yeah. for the first time, I feel. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, Cause so you – and I think that's a great insight to have, uh, Yvonne, just about the fact that whenever we avoid, we're actually avoiding humility. And this idea that you talk about, about making separate groups – inside of yourself mm. and being selective about h how you want to express love to I'll love these people because they're yeah. easy to love but these yeah. ones are challenging me and yeah. I, I, and I don't want to feel that yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so when we make the choice for love what would it look like well it's interesting because I was thinking about that again this morning it's kind of like okay so what I want is to be open-hearted and loving of everybody and realizing and realizing that if I'm not then I'm not wanting to be humble uh -huh. to, to my feelings. And um, there were comments made last night that were shared with me about how our judgments, like even the slightest judgment towards the spirits, can um, block them completely from wanting to come. And it's the same here on earth. And, and often I'm making those judgments so unconsciously. And, and so I... Automatically. Can automatically. we say automatically? Yeah. Automatically, yeah. yes, better yeah. than unconsciously. Yeah. Because um, I think I said to Igor, I said, well, if you'd asked me before, I would have said, no, I don't have any judgments. Yeah. But just the fact that I would be excited that they're open to learning new stuff means that I'm judging what they are now. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I did some repentance about that and felt about that and realised that, you know, Mary, it, it's taken me three years on this path to even want to get out of my self-reliance. So my self-reliance was my... Religion, if you like, yeah, and it's yeah. taken me three years to even want to move to God reliance, yeah, yeah, and um, and so how can I, how can I judge that for any that journey for anybody, like no matter what their religion is? And do you know this is one of the most beautiful gifts that mm. I'm finding of becoming more humble, is mm. that it really um, increases my capaci capacity to have compassion, compassion. for others. Because yeah. I, because yeah. when we're all judging ourselves and judging everyone else, it's it's a very yeah. box like situation, isn't it? Yeah. When we're humble to our pain, immediately there's more consideration and and compassion yeah. for everyone else's pain and everyone else's journey. And it tied into something else in the in the chapter last week, and that's about the part where he said, um, and we didn't discuss it, but it was about the part where he says everybody arriving has their own life story. Mm -hmm. So unless I'm interested and willing. To learn their life story, well, where's the compassion going to come from? Like, well, and like this is the question I'd like to put to all of you because it's beautiful what you guys are reflecting around the decision to be humble and how this is actually a choice for love. 
um, and you're talking about making a choice to be humble, to feel or to not avoid. Um, but my question is, do we make the choice to decide to love first or do we make the choice to decide to be humble first? Do you understand what I'm asking? How, how, if you pass forward to Alexis. Um, well, th this would answer for you both questions. <laughs> I yep. mean, the first question was your religion and two, can we choose love before we're feeling? And um, my realization is again is um, I choose to shut down my feeling quite a bit. Uh -huh. uh, and the reality is it's because I can pretty much feel everything everybody feels. And there's a lot of times at a certain point where I can't even decipher if it's mine or theirs. Mm -hmm. And so... Do you know what would cause that to happen, Alexis? Um, Cause yeah, well, I mean, I, I admit, obviously, there's stuff in me that gets agitated. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, because when, say, when we're at one with God, we'll feel everything that everyone else feels, but we'll also feel ourselves, and we'll have a good sense yeah. of what's me and what's them. Yeah. So... I was just trying to help you sure. a bit no, on the no, sideline. Yeah. What do you think it would be? You said there's agitation. Um, agitation with... When you can feel everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So what's that indica what emotion is that indicating to you? Fear. Fear. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. So there's a feeling of, I can't be me, I, like I've got to let everyone else have their feelings before I have my own. Yeah, yeah. Because that's sort of what's happening, isn't it? You're feeling everyone else and sort of stepping back yourself. Well, when I was young, I, um, I could pretty much feel where my parents were at and, and my siblings were at. And, and if they had any inkling of bad feelings, it was uh, just a matter of time before I would get in trouble or I would get hit or something. Yeah, so you learn to put your feelings in a backseat yeah, and try to make their feelings right. better in order to avoid yeah, exactly. this fear. So that will yeah. help you a lot if you recognize the reason why I really don't want to feel mm -hmm. is because I feel everyone else and that triggers my fear that if unless I please them, I'm going to get physically hurt. hurt. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Anyway, yeah. continue. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So, well, it's just um, along those lines um, that... Um, uh, what was your first question? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, therefore, I, was talking therefore about I have a hard time really being able to love people because I'm actually refusing to feel where they're at, for starters. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a big one for me, I feel. Yeah, so you yeah. feel that we need to choose feeling before we can choose to love? Uh, yeah, for me, because otherwise, and this answers the other question, I, I, my religion is to just go in my head and just kind of calculate everything out, every nuance, every possibility, you know, for each being. Yeah. And at that point, um, I don't really have much compassion or, or anything, you know. Yeah. So, so for me, my experience is that until I could feel them and have understanding and compassion for them, it's kind of hard to really love them genuinely, yeah. Yeah. What do you think would lead you to make that decision, though? Um, to decide to feel them. Cause oh, that to decide to feel them? Yeah, because you're saying, oh. unless I decide to feel them, I can't love them. Is that what well, you think? Well, for me, it's just this recent, for me, it's this realization that um, I'm in more and more pain, um, trying to just figure everything out. Yeah. And trying to put a, a, lo a logical template on the world because it's not. <laughs> and and so, so it's really, it's not working. And so I'm just wanting to kind of go another way. And, and, and there's other pains of just feeling disconnected. So there's a pain that's coming from this, uh, this thing you do where you try to figure everything out. That's yeah. a product of fear, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's how I manage my fear. How you manage fear. Yeah. So Eloisa talked about fear as well, didn't she, and Matt? And you do this sort of... Um, intellectual thing to yeah. help you even manage fear, yeah? Yeah. Um, and so if you're going to, you're saying there's pain increasing from just living in this yeah. intellectual fear Yeah, I'm tired. Thing. You're getting tired of it, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting, really, I'm getting yep. too tired and too yep. old to do it. <laughs> so you're, you're on the pain fear scale, aren't you? you yeah. You've been in fear for a long time now. The pain of the fear is increasing and maybe it'll make a different choice. Yeah, and just to realise it, really. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. to, to, re to choose, you know, not to deny that pain. And yeah. yeah. 
All right, a few other people had their hands up about this, what do we choose first, love or humility. If you pass back to Eloisa and across, Cess, did you have your hand up? One. Yeah. Two of one. I, I think I'm personally choosing humility, but I, I feel I might get the question better now. It's like I feel like I could choose love, but I don't. For and I could justify out of the park, but I won't because it's no point. It's but um, yeah, I just think it's interesting that I'm not choosing love first. Yeah, what would happen if you chose love first? Well, probably the humility would come, <laughs> and I probably wouldn't have to try so hard. So all this like feeling that I'm not trying so hard, and it's a bit of a load of crap. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, to contrast the two ideas between what Alexis said and what you're saying. Alexis is saying, I'm not choosing humility, it's getting really painful, and I can feel like I'm going to get to a point where eventually I'm going to choose humility because it just hurts so much. But then you're saying, ah, oh, hang on, if I chose love first, if I thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to choose to love, I want to love, I want to make that choice to love, then... Yeah, I agree with you. Humility would, would happen as a result of that desire. I also think that your pain would be immediately exposed if it was out of harmony with love. So you wouldn't have to go through this massive painful process to get to the point of so much pain that you will then surrender. It will just be like, it will just be like, okay, I love, whoa, that's painful. Okay, there's something yeah. in me that I need to look at. You know, it'd yeah. probably be a bit simpler. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, if, if love was your framework for every interaction that you had with anyone. If I was having an interaction with Miriam and something came up, and, um, but I thought, okay, I'm afraid in this situation, but I want love, I'm gonna choose love. Then immediately, whatever, whatever fear, discomfort, pain, rejection, whatever might be triggered in that situation would come up far more quickly, wouldn't it, if I made the choice for love. If I was just trying to be humble, then I might, those, those same emotions might eventually come out. But I would be less inclined to make the choice for love and more inclined to sort of... Do what you've always done and do kind it of hide slowly in the corner. And and think about it afterwards and yeah. think, yep, oh, there's that feeling still there. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Yvonne, and then forward to Laura. If we keep the mics on the, the, the same Sorry. sides, it'll get easier, yeah. Um. You've just given me a bit more insight, but I was going to say that for me, the concept of being open-hearted and choosing love first all the time, mm -hmm. right now it's an intellectual thing. Yeah. And so I don't, I can't honestly say I know what that feels like or what it looks like or yeah. how to do that. Uh -huh. Like, but I suppose we learn how to do everything else by just first making a conscious choice. <laughs> So maybe well, it's hard to make scrambled eggs if you don't actually decide <laughs> that you want scrambled eggs, isn't it? <laughs> So maybe the first, maybe I've answered my question. The first step is just making that decision. and It's just something <laughs> I think about sometimes. Like, you know, do I want to choose humility or do I want to choose, choose love? love? I understand that in order to love, I'm going to have to be humble. Mm. But what's my driving force, you know? Love. If it's love, I feel like I'm going to stay the course a lot longer and, and stronger than if I'm just trying to be humble, you know? Yeah. I like what um, Eloise was saying, that if we choose love first, it makes everything else easier. There's a great driving force. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it might incentive. make it more painful, but it seems like yeah. it'll be more rapid. Do you agree? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. If we pass back to Paul and forward to Laura, she had something. And yeah. um, I was just going to say that, um, for an example, this, um, this lady came into my work and she was very angry in the first hit that I got was fear and I just went oh another angry woman like and I thought I could either stay in this fear but that's the place that I'm always in like I see an angry woman and I just go feel my fear be humble and I'm shaken and I don't give my personality I don't give my love I just go Laura just be humble and then I'm just like God I'm missing something because I'm always scared mm -hmm. I'm always going be humble but there's just something I'm not like I'm just going to do something completely different like, yes, be how I am, but what I want to be loving. So she came in and she was like, you know, <laughs> she was in her thing and I just started chatting to her and then I started asking about her desires and what she loved to do when she was little and if she's got children and she ended up pulling up a seat. She ended up talking to me for 20 minutes and almost crying about how lonely her childhood was and 
when she left, she said that was the most beautiful thing. No one has ever taken the time to get to know me. And, and when she left, I just said, all right, God, that was a lesson for me. So have all this time that I thought I was being humble. Like, there's people in this room that I see all the time. And I go, be humble. How do I feel? I'm scared. All right, just feel scared. Just feel shame. Feel rejected. And I stay in that place. And I leave. And I'm like, that was an awful day. I, it didn't go anywhere. I wasn't loving. I didn't give. I'm just stuck. Hmm. So what, I'm, what I just feel to do is, I don't know if it's humble mixed with just, I don't know what the word is, but now I'm just going to go just be me and just love and give my personality. If it gets rejected, give my personality. Just keep giving me because I love this place and I love the people on the path. And if I'm not giving me, then I'm not happy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I, I don't know what I've been confusing humility with. But well, it's I th- not good. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's really like I'm so excited that we're talking about humility and really what the nuances or the, the true humility is because, you know, Yvonne brought up this point about, hang on, it's, it's, it's not about just kind of feeling. It's about acting in a certain way, isn't it? It's about not separating people into boxes and not avoiding them. It's about being open-hearted all the time with everyone. And I think, yeah, we can fall into this pitfall of going, what do I feel? Okay, feel that, feel that, feel that. But that, aren't we just in our intellect then? You know? When we're really present and open-hearted, now big feelings might come up. And that's what humility is. <laughs> when we're there open-hearted and we allow that process to happen. When we're intellectually going, okay, there's that person, I'm afraid of them, okay, just be humble to the fear, just be humble to the fear. You're right, we put ourselves in a box of going, I should be feeling fear now, which is kind of an intellectual thing. Whereas if we go up to that person, be ourselves, like you said, be open-hearted, it doesn't mean we have to pander to them and make, try, to, try to do this thing that Alexis was talking about in his childhood where you put their feelings all before your own and make them feel all happy. No, but if we go up and if we are just ourselves and just offer our open-hearted self without trying to control them, without trying to modify ourselves in some sort of facade, often we find, wow, that fear I felt, it was kind of like a bit of a butterfly in my tummy, then I got over it and I talked to that person and now I don't feel so afraid anymore. Which is, which is processing fear? Taking action. Taking action, Yeah. The real humility is quite an active place that we are in. It's embracing life. It's embracing interactions. And it's, but obviously, we're used to doing those things with facade, with control, with, and all of those things are not humility. So when, when we say humility is how we feel in the moment, honour that and stay how we are, and yes. most of the time for me it's either shame or fear. Yeah. So what, where's, th- where's the, um, the lack of understanding of that terminology? Because that is not how God wants us to be when we're confronted with a brother and sister, just in, even if you're talking to them. But what is that belief that's not correct it's it's not humility it's some it's something else (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. so uh, let's talk about how do you think god desires us to be with our brothers and sisters we start at the end of that statement open open yeah yeah let's hear from other people as well karina and dave sorry paul we'll come back to you yeah when we get god desires us to be with each other as he would love us to be which is um, not judging and accepting and ha- full of compassion and it's a full love, okay. a really rich, full love. Yeah, so that's God's desire for how he would love for us to be with each other. How, how do we get from where we are now to this place where we're totally open and, and loving everyone? Just that going with what's in my heart at the moment. Instead of skipping from my heart to my head, oh, if I do that, is that the right thing? Yeah. S- so you're talking about not trying to control interactions with people? Yeah, if you go to Matt. Um, I, I feel like uh, f- like engaging sincerely 100% where we're at. But, and what, but what le- I agree, but what does yeah. that really look like or um, mean? Well, that, like, that we don't let um, the, the feelings that we've got inside of us stop us from actually completely engaging and risking that it might get really messy. So we just engage open-heartedly without controlling? 
Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. If you pass back to Pete. Yeah. Just linking in what Matt was talking about, what I've noticed in myself, when I look at when I'm loving and open, mm -hmm. and then when I'm looking when I'm not loving and open, what I've found in myself is there's a direct correlation to how I feel about abundance often. So when I'm feeling passionate, open and abundant, then it's really easy to love. Yeah. Then when I'm blocking the emotions around that, then yeah. I find it really difficult to love. Yeah. So for myself, it's like, what's the block to the loving and to get to the loving bit? And often it's some of these feelings that we have, you know, that relate to what love would mean. Yeah. Yeah. So it means that, would you say then, when you feel that you're less loving with people, you're, you're trying to restrict an emotion that's already there inside of you? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm You're trying to. Just, I'm not wanting to feel the lack of abundance in my life or what's happening in my life. Yep. And I'm preventing that emotion coming up. Yep. And then I find it. Di then I feel restricted. And yep. then it, it's not making it a flowing, like just with AJ this week. It's like like when he talk about the um, tree and the water and the the food. It's like it's just pouring out. And yep. there's this real abundance we love. Yep. I just sort of notice in myself, well, when I am in that real abundance and plentiful side, then loving's just so easy yeah. relative to the other side. Yep, yep. So when, we're, when you're in fear or when you're avoiding fear, then it all gets shut down. Shuts down so straight away. we're engaging open-heartedly with others, but our heart has to stay open to our own feelings, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. So if we go to Teresa over here. Um, I'm, f I'm not sure how to um, engage with someone when I fear that I'm just going to walk all over them. I'm going to, I'm not going to be loving to them. Um, but then I don't want to control, because I know I control how, how I have. To, I want to control myself. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to. Um, if like if someone comes up to me, yeah, how do I not just be my true feelings, which is to probably slaughter them? When you say that, Teresa, what do you mean? What do you mean you want to slaughter them? I'm just very afraid of my anger. Yeah, yeah. How do, what do you um? How you do one with it? Yeah. So at the moment, I'm feeling like I just want to go under a rock. Yeah. yeah. But that's not going to help me. Like Laura was saying, it's 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 the actual engagement. So so can who who else can help? What do you think? What do you think for Teresa and Laura? What is this this thing that is making them feel confused about how we interact? Yeah, if we come to Dave. When we interact, first and foremost, we're interacting with another person, with yeah. a brother or a sister. Yeah. Somebody who has injuries and pains and fears, just like we do. And, and if we can respond from that place rather than from, from what do I do, how do I do it, and I don't do it myself, but if we come from, from that place of the heart and, and stay in that place, we'll be humble ourselves and we'll also be, be more real and, and, and showing our brother and sister us and, and allowing them to be them. Yeah, I agree with you, but we have to be, it's, it's difficult, like we can't get into this natural love path thing, can we, where we just go, this is my brother, this is my sister, and this is what, uh, the reason I want to really tease this out with you guys is I feel like a lot of people fall down this crack and go, well that was all facade, I don't actually feel that about people, but then they like throw out love with the bathwater, <laughs> you know, they're like, no, I don't, you know, and w so what is, what is, what does this really mean if we go to Matt? We're really talking about I, what is humility. I think we've got to be ready to, to take an act that's really, from how we, our current beliefs, really risking something big. Like, you know, like, oh, with Teresa, that she, this fear that she might jump in and attack and slaughter and control or whatever it is other people. But be willing to take that risk and just see what happens anyway, like with at least some intellectual understanding that, oh, this fear that I have is 
highly likely irrational and high, like from a love from a love perspective and um you know there's some false beliefs in there and so maybe i need to challenge these false beliefs by taking an action even though i'm so scared that i'm just going to get rejected or i'm going to do some rejecting or whatever it might be yeah so i agree we're going to have to start doing things that feel like risk yeah. they feel different to what we've done before i agree with that yeah if we go to yvonne um Something I've noticed for myself, Mary, is, this, is that if I stay in my fear, then I will become controlling and unloving as opposed to... And, and usually that's because I don't want to risk speaking my truth. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, it's made a difference to find the courage, no matter how I'm, I'm feeling, to speak my truth. Mm. So it's actually the risk of being ourselves, isn't it? Yeah. This thing that Laura said about, I've just got to be myself. <clears throat> Mm. Yeah, and if that means I'm feeling anger come up or whatever, and say, listen, I really want to connect with you today, and just feeling angry. So if I leave the room, it's not you, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And can you see why both AJ and I spend so much time talking to you guys about accessing your real feelings? You need to do you, like Teresa. You can feel there's rage in you at the moment. Now, if I if I want to choose love, I will choose being open-hearted and not controlling situations and risking being myself with others but if it's that close to the surface and I know it's there if I want to choose love then I'll say look unless I deal with this there is a there's a huge likelihood it's going to spill out on other people so I'm going to have to take responsibility aren't I so part of humility is taking responsibility for what's inside of me and and part of choosing love is desiring to change to make that change and you know how to do you have tools how to do that now how to, you know that your soul you can let it out and it won't be there anymore if if you access things in a causal way so part of it is is not just in the moment with people i agree it's when you're away from people and taking responsibility for what's there but if we come back to you laura this i think it's a really good question that you that you asked about so what is it that i'm missing because i feel like i am afraid and i am ashamed but I also know that when I try to feel that, I'm not being myself with other people. Is that really the question? Yeah, if you just pass. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, probably should. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> that, that is the question. And, and sometimes when I, when I feel those things, I can say to myself, Laura, don't go there. It's self-punishment. But then I go, but there's a reason the spirits are hooking into these feelings because they actually are in my soul. So honour it. So I honour it and stay there thinking that the natural love path is, Laura, don't even, don't even, you know, so I get, I get confused. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, honestly, it's a fear of just owning, owning yourself, really. I feel that most of us are very, and yourself included, we're so used to presenting facade, you know, and sometimes we, we feel like, oh, actually, I'm afraid and ashamed, but aren't I also a happy person? Hang on, who is me? And I think you might have and mentioned that. And what's the truth? Because sometimes I go, wait a minute, the truth is, is that God loves me, so go with that truth. But that feels, nat it feels like I'm, I'm, I'm telling myself that intellectually, but if I go, all right, God, what, what's the, the one number thing here is be honest. I'm really scared and I'm ashamed and I'll stay with that, but then the whole day is just ruined. So it's... But that, do you see that when you stay, when you say, I'll stay with that, do you feel you're actually staying with it? I feel like I'm staying with it, but I'm not, I'm missing a vital thing of dropping into a place where it can transform or shift or change. It's, I just stay there. Yeah. I'm either out of it or I'm just uh, all day. Trying, 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 trying to. And it's, time's ticking, like I'm not, I'm just saying like life, and it, it's ticking by and I'm staying, thinking that it's humility and it's not. And it's not, yeah. If you pass back to Yvonne and pass behind you here. Yeah. Um, I feel, Laura, because I'm looking at you, I feel that, because um, I've done this sometimes too, obviously, that that's the difference between sitting in the emotion and actually thinking, now I really want to grieve about this and actually dropping through to something else? Yeah, I, I agree. But there is, there's this point, isn't there, where we say, I know this feeling's inside of me, so I, I know it's going to have to come out of me. So I'm going to have to sort of sit with it for a while, aren't I? But if I'm sitting with it and sitting with it and sitting with it and a day's gone past and, uh, like, I haven't felt any of it and also I've felt like, 
I'm kind of now self-punishing or it feels like there's all these spirits with me now and this is yuck and now I can't even remember anything good. Uh, <laughs> who has days like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in that case, I ask myself a series of questions. Why don't I want to be... <laughs> I, you know, I have to admit the truth. I, I don't, I'm afraid to connect to whatever this feeling is about. I don't want to do it right now. Why don't I want to do it? That's where I have to start, you know? Uh, and how much do I want to choose self-punishment rather than actually connect to the truth? So sometimes I'm trying to feel something that's not even a real emotion in me because I prefer it to another one or I prefer it to just being myself. Sometimes I go, oh, I'm afraid of this person and I should just or I could do this, I, I don't necessarily do this one, but, you know, I f feel afraid of this person, I, I'm just going to feel afraid of them, but it's actually my excuse to not confront the fear of actually being myself with them. Do you see that? Yeah, Laura? Um, that feels extremely true, yeah. because if I look at the law of desire, I'm desiring in that moment not to be myself because I've got the excuse that I'm in the shame or fear. Yes. Whereas if I really desired to be myself, it, it would be that. So my desire is to avoid that yeah. by staying stuck in these emotions, using the excuse of humility when it, it's just an excuse. Yeah. Because if I'm myself and I get rejected, that's going to be the most excruciating pain in the world. Yeah. So I would rather flip it and think that I'm doing the divine love thing, but I'm not. Perfect, perfect. I feel a lot of us get caught up in this. We, use, we end up using the, the life-giving, freedom-giving teaching to keep us in prison, you know, because it's scary. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's great. Laura. Thank you. I feel like you nailed it, yeah. Paul, you had your hand up earlier. What, do you remember? It's... I was just re referring to the question, um, what first do we do, the humility or the love? Yes. And, and me and Mel have been talking about it and I think for myself it's just a thing of um, if I'm self-loving then I will be, it sort of gives me permission to be present to myself and to carry myself, you know, with my feelings yep. and, 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 and then it works for me, you know, yep. so it's like I'm allowed to hold myself in this, you know, whatever space. Yep. And, um, so it's really you've chosen love, haven't you? And yeah. that allows you to be more humble. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's right. And the, the self-love, that's right. It seems like... A, it, but the self-love enables me then not to project on the other and yeah. enables me not to live in the fear. Yeah. Because if the fear comes up, well, then I can be a bit more sort of just present to what's happening and, and all that. Yeah, yeah. I feel it's, it's really interesting to think about, you know, from this passage... Krishna is saying to us, love is the true religion. Love is the thing that will mark where you enter into the spirit world. And we spend a lot of time talking about humility. And lots of times I see people forget that the whole reason we talk about humility is because of love. We're saying it's going to be easier to love. You're actually going to be able to love authentically if you are humble. But I do... I feel for myself. I don't know if it's the same for everyone, but I feel like... I, it's a much more powerful place when I say, I want to love. I'm choosing that. And then it leads me through all kinds of things that I would... I, I don't want to go there if I, if I want to choose to just be comfortable and safe. You know, if I want comfort and safety, I can try to be humble, but I'm not going to get very far, you know? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yep. If we just pass forward to Catherine and we'll make our way forward. Yeah. Um, I've been avoiding people all my life. Yeah. And I just noticed when I came in here, I came and sat down. I put half my stuff on this chair, half my stuff on the other chair. Yeah. So no one could come and sit, sit near with me. You. Yeah. So and just how, yeah, how frightened I am of anyone and everyone. Yeah. And the, there's no love in any of that at all. Well, you're not even really loving yourself, are you? No, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's what I mean. There's yeah. just no love yeah. anywhere for myself or anyone else. Or mm. Yeah. So what would be the humble choice you would make, Catherine? Well, I think I'm, <laughs> I, I just automatically do these things now. But it's so great that you're seeing it. Do, do you see you had so a whole big realisation right there? 
Yes. So I, I've probably got to work back and, and see where all this began. And um, Do you know what? I think it's much easier than that. What would be the humble choice? If you pass back to Eloisa, she'll tell you because she's busting out of her seat to tell you. <laughs> I reckon if you sat down next to the most person you're the most afraid of in the room. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I think even if you just sat next to someone next time you arrived and said, hi, how are you going? Right. <laughs> that, you know, I guess what I'm trying to illustrate is... Um, Without, you know, you could do it this way. You've had the realisation, you're like, okay, I'm keeping myself separate from people for a lot of my life. I know I'm afraid. I'm going to have to trace this back and really feel what this is about. And you can go home and, and do that. And you, you, probably, you probably will naturally because you've had this realisation. But if every week you come back and keep doing the same thing, you'll still be doing that on your own. If the next time you come, you bring all your stuff and you sit right next to someone and even say hi, whoa, I bet you're going to be able to access a lot more of those feelings that you've been keeping subdued for a long time. Do you see? So you can work in tandem with these things. This is what humility is, looks like in action, you know, where you actually take the action to, to choose love. I'm going to sit next to someone. I'm still going to do my work at home, but I'm actually going to challenge what I can see as an error in me with faith that God's going to sh help me heal it. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. No worries. If we go to Michael, he had his hand up. Mary, I, I'd choose love every time because I feel that all the humans on earth and all the animals crave love. Yeah. And in each case with humans and animals, if they have issues, they all relate back to a time when they felt they weren't loved. Yeah. And from the point of view of being humble, I think that follows on when you've got love to spread throughout the world. Yeah, and, and actually, would you agree, Michael, that when we make the choice to love, then if we really want that and we recognise there's something in us that's preventing us from being loving, if we really want to love, that will lead us to be humble to that thing that we recognise. Yes. Yeah, 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 I agree with you. Yeah. Okay, thank you if you pass across. Yeah. Oh, you, you, yeah? Um, I, I feel I'm only just starting because I had a realisation how I thought all my life I, I was loving. So I realised that I'd had a wrong concept of love and I've just been realising how arrogant and intellectual and, and, and avoiding and addictive I am and I haven't dealt with that yet. But my first port of call was to look at I realised, so I, have a, I don't have a good um, idea of love. So I, I looked at the word love and what is love? God is love. And my first, I went right down and I said, right, God is love. And I said to him, well, why am I like, you know, I've heard all this wonderful, something that I've wanted to hear all my life. Why aren't I doing it? Why aren't I, you know, really powering ahead? And I got that I really don't trust God. Mm. I don't trust him yeah. to sort of, you know, when I become open-hearted, I don't trust him that, um, that he, he, he can... I know intellectually, I know that yeah. I can trust him and he's been giving me so many examples that I can trust him. Yeah. But why haven't I got it here? And it's, it's just my um, really strong desire to hold on, hold on. Otherwise, you'll just be... A, um, you, I sort of had this concept that God's going to make us... Um, uh, take from us first before he gives to us. Yeah. So I'm going to have to be left with nothing just to show uh, how loving he is and then he's going to give it to me. Yeah. It's not, yeah. It's not logical, yeah. I know, but... That's but I feeling. feel you're expressing feelings that most of us have. Yeah. This, and even Alexis last week was expressing some of this, like, I know I want to make another choice, but it feels so vulnerable just to open my heart and, and like, trust mm. God. Trust that when I open mm. my heart, God is going to love me. And mm. so I feel that a lot of what you've expressed as well, if, if you try to just pray about opening up to how those kinds of feelings were there in your relationship with your parents this feeling that I'm going to have to give before I get and, and to just 
So just pray about grieving some of that stuff. I feel it will help you begin to trust God more. Yeah. But I think it's a fantastic um, realisation to have. I know it hurts, but, you know, as we hurt, we kind of grow as well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Uh, <clears throat> I've been sitting here wondering, do I ask a question or not? Um, it's, it's like I'm picking up all these threads of humility and you're saying, you know, what is humility? Let's tease this out. And I, I didn't quite catch what Laura said last. And I'm thinking, do I go home and, and, and just wait till the, till the DVD comes out? So, Dave, are you being humble right in this second? I don't know. That's what I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I'm just trying to, to, trying to follow my heart. Yeah. Can you see how we often avoid humility by going, I'm afraid about this question. Um, I'll, I'll give a big intro into it to try and make everyone understand me and help me avoid my fear a bit and then I'll ask my question. What would be the really humble thing to do? Just to ask the question. and Just ask the question, let yourself feel about it. Feel before you begin, is there, is there a demand in this question? Do I, and if you're satisfied that, okay, I don't feel that there is, I'm just going to ask it, it feels like a risk, feel a bit exposed and then I'll be humble to whatever feedback I, I, I receive. That's a humble choice. When we try to, and I, I've caught myself doing it many times, uh, probably doing it right now because I'm trying to water down the truth I'm giving you by saying I'm like you. <laughs> <laughs> but when we try to give precursors to things, it's really important that we watch out if we're trying to avoid fear. If we're trying to, you know, I, I, if, I, if you can understand me a bit, then I'll expose myself. I've avoided the fear of just, hey, this is me right now. Or if I see something that I feel it's a gift to give my brother this truth, but I'm afraid that he's going to feel ridiculed or put down when I do it, even though I feel like in my heart I'm loving, then I might say, Dave, it's not just you, it's me, don't worry. But that's me avoiding the fear of you just feeling bad from me offering a truth. Can you, can you see? Uh, this is, you know, and we probably should stop talking about humility because I'm, you know, I'm going to do a study group on it. And <laughs> I'm obviously passionate about it. That's why we're, it's, we're really talking about it um, because we should talk about the book. But it is, it is inherent in the book, obviously. Yeah, yes to all that. Yeah. And I realise what I'm wanting is a magic bullet. I'm yeah. wanting a simple answer, a set of points that I can take away. That, oh, that's humility. I'm right now. Yes. And... So many of us want that, don't we? If I tick these boxes, that's humble and that's what I have to do. Or, you know, and so many times I've had people ask myself or ask Jesus, if this thing is happening and that thing is happening, what should I do? <laughs> and that's the same as wanting a rule book, isn't it? It's, it, it's, it's avoiding the humility of the situation. Yeah, yeah. Sess, you had your hand up. What I'm getting from this book is, and I maybe because I was reading so many chapters all at once in a few days, yeah. is such a graphic, Im such graphic images and then feelings. I love it because it appeals to my imagination, this book. Yeah. And of how much love there is available to me. And so I feel that that gift of receiving all this love is really helping me um, go even more deeply into my fear, which feels like such a bottomless pit. But it's just, I, I mean, I can't really do much else some of the time yeah. because it's so completely overwhelming. But um, I just feel like there are all these beautiful celestial spirits. They must be. It feels so amazing yeah. around me just saying, we can help you all... In the last few days, since the last book group, I'm just feeling we can help you, we can help you, and and so it's, it's almost impossible to not feel them. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's it's really it's it's a very beautiful thing that I'm getting from this book. That's I'm very lovely. grateful. Yeah. And so it's the love coming, and yeah. So it, so in that example, it's the. Opening your heart even to receive love is assisting your humility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because that's the thing. Of course, I don't feel there's any love for me. There yeah. is none. Yeah. I'm just completely alone. I'm totally so afraid that I have to just do everything myself. Yeah, 
Mm. Yeah. And yet when we open ourselves up and feel the love, then ironically, ironically that we, you know, there's this beautiful dance that humility and love do where as we choose love, we become more humble. As we become more humble, we receive more love. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a building process, yeah. yeah. And it doesn't just feel like one or two. It just feels like heaps around me. Awesome. Just, mm. So let's, let's talk about the book then because we didn't finish discussing everything in the book last week, did we? No. <laughs> there was a lot we didn't get to. And this, this, um, this is something that really struck me in Siamidi's home. Everything in the environment is just designed with love in mind, isn't it, in order to give love. Is there anything you got that's struck you guys about that passage uh, we talked about it briefly last week I think but this all of the elements of Siamese's home and the love inherent in all of it was there anything from that that you guys found uh, if we go back to Eloisa or if you had any questions about that section Oh, I didn't have any questions, but yep. I just loved the I, I love his descriptions I just uh, I could just they're like, for me, they're like lollies. <laughs> lollies. <laughs> but it's like, I love like how everything was like self-luminous. And though it's so huge, it's so intimate. And everyone's cared for and everything's provided for. And God knows best. And like they don't even know where stuff comes from, but they just know that it comes from God. Yeah. You know, and all, I, I did have actually one question. Yeah. And that was, oh, this might be, hold on, it might not be relevant just yet. Um. When they're talking about the tree and the water and they say that it takes rise in the vicinity of the throne of God uh -huh. for it never varies in its consistency. Yeah. Does that just mean they don't know where it really comes from so they just say that it comes from God or does it literally come from the throne of God and does God have a throne? <laughs> <laughs> Good questions. What do you guys think? Who's got some ideas about those? That? Where, do you, where do you think the stream comes from? Yep, Cecily? Yeah. Yeah, you've got the mic. Then we go to Karina. Yeah. Um, I think perhaps because God is so eternal and limitless um, and that stream seems to be the same, that it's probably a fair assumption that it comes from God. Yep, yep. And all good things come from God. Yes, yep. As I believe. Yep, absolutely. Um, Karina? I don't think it's a physical throne. I think it's allegorical uh -huh. and it's... It's just his poetic, beautiful way of putting things. Yeah. And by calling it the throne of God, you give God in that same moment the majesty. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I don't think there's a literal... Well, no, I don't think there's a literal throne. But the, he's trying to imbue the sense of, like, the majesty of God and the, the um, you know, the power of God, I suppose, through that. And it's a very common Christian turn of phrase, I believe, to say the throne of God. So he's also drawing that link, as he often does through the, the literature. Yeah. Matthew? Um, I guess part of it is probably, like, relating back to my own life and being like, well, with my little cottage, you know, I can actually change the way that it's set up at the moment so that it's more geared towards giving love to um, others and myself. Ah, uh, yeah. 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 And I was feeling about your houses in the spirit world, you guys, and that um, I feel that maybe I've visited at least one of them yep. and that it's very much around giving, like giving. giving love and, yeah. and giving to others and things like that. And, and there's a real passion and a joy in that and the, the space kind of reflects that. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. So it made you think about how is my space giving love? Well, yeah, 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 it's just, well, especially now, it's just kind of sitting here thinking, feeling about it and being like, well, that would be a, like a like a great lesson to take out of this chapter. It's like, well, how can I be more like Siamese in that yeah. way? Yeah. yeah. I, had, I had this experience last year where I realised all my life I've been serving my environment and how, how can, you know, I've been doing housework and trying to keep everything clean and keep all my stuff in order and all of these things where I'm just sort of serving this job how could I design my life so that my environment actually gave to me, made my life more easy, made, you know, gave to the people who came into our home so that it was easy for them to access things and easy for them to feel at home and welcome. So, yeah, it's a lovely reflection, that. Yeah. It's a, yeah. All right. Who are the types of people in Siamese's home? Yep. Um, 
they were the kind, they were the types of people who, although they suffered under a lot of uh, injustice and really poor treatment, never once um, did they give in to that and be like their oppressors. Yes. That they were willing to continually stand up for love and truth and no matter how they'd be treated and um, take risks every single day, even if it meant uh, uh, eventually that their children died or they died or yeah. terrible things happened in their life, that that uh, love and truth was so important to them that they still wouldn't deviate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty amazing, hey? So let's talk about the story of the first woman that we meet in the chapter. Who can, who can relay some of her story, what you saw in her story? Karina? Uh, I just wanted to say that it, the bit that got me was um, that um, these parents of her husband had done the dirty on him. Yeah. And so they suffered huge privations um, and she was, you know, under this enormous stress of sewing, cleaning, washing, cooking, everything, night and day. Um, but when her husband went out, to, I guess, to try and find work or mm -hmm. bring home the, the bread, mm -hmm. she, um, she would, it says here, but the wife never allowed the fire of her love to go down. No murmur was ever breathed from her lips, no anxious inquiry if he had succeeded when his weary footsteps sounded on her ears like music at night lest her asking should increase his disappointment. I just thought, I'm not there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, good, because I want to talk about the qualities that this lady displays. But if, Joanne, you had your hand up, did you? Can you give us a summary of, the, of her life as we hear about it? Um, well, she, she was very oppressed by, you know, the way that, Man sees religion and, and that, uh -huh. but she kind of went against that and just went with what she felt was in her heart and that was very much based on love. Yeah. So the story is she married a man who was destined for priesthood or, or her, his family wanted him to become a preacher or a priest. And he, why didn't he become one? Eloisa? Or M Michael? If we just go across to Michael. Yep. Because he felt the religion was only half truth and he didn't want to be involved in preaching a half truth. Half truth, yeah. So he had this feeling of integrity. I'm not going to do something that I don't believe in. And he, she was married to him and they had children. And his, as um, Karina brought up, his parents tried to do something. What did they try to do? If you pass back to Eloisa. Yeah. They tried to manipulate him back into the priesthood because they didn't approve of his decisions. And what was their justification? Basically, they came to the conclusion that God had ordained a little trial for their son, yes. which really they'd ordained they were God. Yes. So they decided, I know what God wants for our son. I'm allowed to do yes. something very cruel to him by getting him fired, didn't they, um, so that he will come back to the church. Yeah. What else happened in the story? Uh, yep, Eloisa. But they he, they didn't uh, like they didn't go back, and he just looked for work, and she and she just supported him, mm -hmm. and because she knew, I think I reckon she felt the same way really, and they both just supported each other. Had more kids, I think they had thirteen, and three died, and yeah, um, yeah, until she died, yeah, because of everything she'd put in. Yeah, so here she is now in Siamese's home, and what are the qualities then that we see that she's displayed? Karina, what was the quality that you saw in her that you said, I'm not even there yet? Well, it's a very beautiful word in the, uh, towards the end of the chapter, which I loved, called self-abnegation. Self-abnegation, yes. which is putting aside the self in the service of others. And I sort of liked it better than self-immolisation, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, Im immolation, yeah. Immolation, yeah. because that was setting yourself on fire. <laughs> <laughs> But self-abnegation really appeals to me. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Well, let's talk about self-abnegation. At the end of the chapter, um, which is actually in reference to something else, but it, it, um, Fred says to us, God knows the cry of a broken heart is bitter, but remember, if the first duty of a follower of Christ is love, the second is self-abnegation. 
Now, do you agree with that statement? Corina does. Well, yes, I do. Yes? <laughs> Mar uh, Miriam, sorry, I nearly called you the wrong name. I think there's a, a thin line there. You've, I, I, it, it, it sounds like it's a bit close to martyrdom in a way, and that's definitely not self-loving. So I guess it depends on the interpretation. Yeah. So if you're all self-sacrificing like the, the saints of old, you know, and the, the Christian traditions, and it, it was all about others and not about yourself, that's not a loving place at all. No, it? we know that about love now, don't we? Yeah. 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 So if we go to Alexis now. Thank you. Yep. Um, also, I think, you know, in that process that people do these things, it's like, where are they coming from? Um, it could, the emotion could be one of rebellion. Yes. Um, and so these things really depend too. So it depends on the quality of the heart, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Performing the act. Right. I looked up self-abnegation as well. And I, the definition I found was the setting aside of self-interest for the sake of others or for a belief or principle. And um, later on in the description of this first lady, it talks about her staying true to her duty. And I looked up duty as well, because that's often a word that we feel pretty heavy around. And the, one of the definitions I found was a duty is a moral obligation or the compulsion felt to meet such an obligation. So this is, this is the area that I wanted to discuss with you guys. As Miriam says, if we're, if we're martyring ourselves completely, we're not expressing our personality, we're doing everything for the sake of others, we're living with a lot of um, uh, self-punishment as, as a feeling that this will make us more please accepting, acceptable to God, then we know, okay, this, this is not loving. But what does it mean if I'm setting aside self-interest for the sake of others or for a belief or principle? How, I believe there's truth in that statement. We talked about it a little bit last week, Matthew. Um, to me, it feels like um, n not willing to uh, compromise on love and truth in order just that um, things will go well. Yeah. In my um, <laughs> in my experience, like yeah. will you know go smoothly in terms of people will now give me approval and I'm not going to get in trouble and um, yeah, yeah. So we could call our self interest all our desires to feel comfortable, to be accepted, to be liked, yeah. and we could say we have to set aside those things mm. and choose love and truth and a moral stance, mm. and in doing that, we we're, we're not actually denying our real self. We're actually getting closer aren't we to our real self but we are does not we are um ridding ourselves of this feeling that my self-interest is the most important thing that my um welfare and my safety is more important than others or than a principle or belief mm. that's the beauty i thought it was beautiful also karina this idea that that we would do that and i feel it is a part of how we grow in love that we put aside this feeling that I'm the most important person in the world. And we say love and truth are the most important principles in the world. Yeah. Mm. And, and it was interesting that she didn't, like, she could have made different choices and got an easy pass out. Yes. Um, and I, I guess her example was probably one of, or I guess in some ways I feel that maybe um, a lot of the times when we do choose a more loving like we do choose to stay with the principles of love and truth. Yeah. Um, that there will be more support, but like, that like God gives us a lot of opportunities um, before we know that to challenge it. Yeah. To challenge those fears that oh, it's not going to work out, and I'm just going to get you know, shitty result, and I'll be homeless or whatever the fear or yeah. might be. Yeah. Well, and also, can you see that now she's in a place that's incredibly loving? And it was actually the wills of men, particularly her parents-in-law, the wills of men and women that actually caused her quite a deal of personal pain in her life. So God can't restrict the will of those people. But what do you think the... Um, there's something there. She had, she had a lot of hardship, didn't she? But she had something else internally that would have carried her through all of that. If you go to Laura, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also feel that because 
her will was in line with harmony of love. Mm -hmm. So when she did all these things, there was this strength in her and this kind of the, it, it, this this strength carried her her through. She wasn't she wasn't resentful, and she, she it, it wasn't there was no kind of emotion there that was. I don't know, it was just like there's this faith and this trust and this knowing that she's got the, the integrity. She had faith, she had integrity, didn't she? Yeah. To her belief. She just knew that it, it was right. It was this sense of righteous, not righteousness, rightness. Yeah. Good, she, I don't know how. She to... wasn't willing to compromise rightness in order to have comfort. Yes. How many of us feel like we're in that place? <laughs> Matt's like, I'm man down for that bit. <laughs> and had she gone, I'm really tired, sorry 13 kids, but mum's just got to go and just chill out for a while and, you know, I want to do my thing. It's that that actually, like, she just had a duty and I, I just feel that because she was in harmony with love, there would have been a lot of support there um, from her guides or so, like, I just feel love yeah. would have supported Well, and her. internally, can you see that she could have sacrificed these this integrity, couldn't she, and, and gotten external comfort, but what do you think her internal world would have been like? Yeah, yeah okay. So she, even though we say, wow, you know, it must have been hard for her to see that God was really looking after her, and I agree, externally, it must have been hard for her to see. Inside of her, she would have had a, a feeling, wouldn't she? Along with a lot of grief and sorrow, but there's a feeling inside of her that wasn't moved. A sense of, you know, I know that I'm staying true to what I feel is right. Yeah. And in that, she showed a lot of humility. She was weeping, she was longing, she was praying. Yep. So there was um, that, the faith was, was, was mentioned there. Humility, of, yep. Uh, yep, yep. Oh, I don't, yep. What other qualities did we see in her? Because there's quite a lot there, yep. If we go to someone else, Joanne, yep. Um, it says too that she never, never really complained, you know. I mean, it says that, you know, for the world outside, she just had nothing but smiles. So, and I feel that if she'd, if she'd gone to that place where, you know, she went and complained to everyone about how hard her life is, she would not have felt that good inside. Yes, yep. So she didn't make it everyone else's problem. Specifically, she didn't make it her husband's problem, did she? I've got written here, um, she did not submit to fear, she stayed true to herself, and she did not project at her husband for not providing or reducing her fear. How many of us women can say that we do that with our partners? Yep. Even though I'm afraid, I never make it his problem. <laughs> so there's, there's quite a lot of humility just in that point, isn't there? We go to Alexis. Um, I'm just wondering, Mary, if, if she had displayed all these qualities and she was able to grieve and whatever, why did she meet that fate on earth regardless? Because according to what we're being taught is that if you do feel these things and if you do yearn for truth in God, that you will be helped. And... It seems like on some level she wasn't really fully helped until she reached the spirit world on some level, yeah. yeah so I I'm think a little bit confused about that. I think there's two things, Alexis. Um, the first is that I don't feel that she was completely grieving. Okay. You know, she still, yeah. she still was um, uh, like holding things together rather than letting things fall apart emotionally. So I feel that there's that. There's also this idea, though, that I feel is really important for all of us to think about, which is the fact that God is never going to control the will of someone else. Mm -hmm. So we could reach a point where we stay in harmony with the principles of love and truth and everyone around us punishes us. Yeah. I guess that's what happened to Jesus, right? In a way. Yeah, that's exactly what happened to him. Yeah. And... I suppose the reason why I brought up this idea of what she had internally is because often we're all looking outside of ourselves. If I cry about this, if I pray about this, then I'm going to get a million dollars. Um, or, you know, everyone's going to stop attacking me. And we, we, don't, we don't necessarily always think about it in, if I cry about this, if I pray about this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow towards God. I'm going to feel God more with me. I'm going to receive more of God's love. And then no matter what happens around me, I'm going to feel better. <laughs> and, and can you see the distinction? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm feeling possibly, you know, at the time she didn't 
perceive God as an entity and, and didn't directly ask for help. Like, I don't maybe. know. I don't, uh, yeah, like, I, there could be that dynamic too, perhaps. I don't there know. could be. My sense is that she did view God as an entity. Um, but, I, yeah, I don't think that she understood the, the power of submission to what, the, her pain either. But I, but I also feel this other point that I made is quite important, that yeah, yeah, there will be more. times in your life where maybe nobody supports you and you are really struggling, but if you have a relationship with God, that won't be as um, devastating for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. there is... What, how does she feel about God through all this? Yeah. I was puzzling with this and with my own sort of thing. Well, why does? Why did she have so many children? Why did she? And then I read the passage that um, says that she was weeping and praying, longing for rest, which they okay. But she, then she talks about the children that died, and she said her mother's heart yearned with an ever strengthening love. In other words, she loved every single bit of these children. She had love for these children. It wasn't a hard duty for her. She had love for a husband and she had love, real love for her children. Mm -hmm. So she was doing it out of love. So it was a hardship for her, but I believe that she was receiving uh, love from God in some way because she had so much to give and she was giving it incredibly. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think she might have had so many children, though, given the time era? (laughs) There's no contraception. (laughs) But she must have wanted them to have so many, surely, in some way. Well, I mean, we could get into a deep psychoanalysis here of this character, (laughs) but I feel that there's some lessons being um, demonstrated to us through this story um, that are all about um, qualities uh, regarding choosing love over fear. Yeah. Um, Karina? The quality that I want to see up on the board is love because it, that this whole paragraph and this lady's life to me is a demonstration of the power of love. Mm-hmm. And um, when you were talking before about which comes first, humility and love, I feel that the lo- what struck me was the, the power of the love she had for her husband was like so gigantic that she was able to feel into he's had a, such a rough time and can't find work and it was just a thing that she wanted to do was just care for him in such a loving way and with the children as well and yeah. I, I just feel that's the power of love that's yeah. being demonstrated. I guess what I'm putting on the board is some of the... the, the um, I agree, we can see her love, but I'm asking you guys to reflect on the quality she displayed in that love. Well, I'll say uh, unselfishness, unselfishness then is one of those qualities. Yes. Which, is, which is a part of humility, isn't it? She, she actually didn't say, my emotions are more important than the truth of what's happening in this situation. She wasn't self-absorbed, she was mm-hmm. unselfish. Yep. If you pass to Cess... I was just going to say self-abnegation, the very thing we yes. were looking at before. Yeah, definitely. That, I mean, so she's the great example in this chapter. Yeah. And what about her relationship with God, Paul, if you go back? I'm asking guys to reflect on this because often I f- see people around us skip this. So. Um, it sounds a bit like my mum, yeah. this lady, and, yeah. it, and it's, uh, I'm feeling it's easy to idealise this lady yes, as well. I agree. And that she was a person, you know, struggling with her stuff and exactly. doing her stuff. But it yep. seemed like her love overbalanced her era and <laughs> stuff like that. Well, and I feel actually, I feel it was mainly her integrity to certain things that hel- that she she wasn't willing to blame her husband because she see it w- could see it wasn't his fault. You know, she could see that. And lots of us, even if we rationally see it, we still choose to blame or demand from our partner that they make our fear go away. Or, And I agree, Paul, like obviously she had pain in her life and I feel the reason why we all get a bit iffy about idealising her or saying, why didn't she receive God's love is because we're all going, hang on, <laughs> 
we're picking at the truths we've already been given. <laughs> you know, we want it all to be laid out for us really simply without actually having to engage a process for ourselves. We want to just read a thing go, yep, that supports the truth that I believe. You know, rather than, I feel your point is really valid, that this is a woman who obviously had struggles in her life, but there were certain things in her character, certain things in the way she behaved on earth, that have led her to be really loved and cared for now, and also, I believe, to have held on to some sense of um, self-dignity inside of herself as she passed. Yeah. So, did you have more to say, or is that your... No, I, uh, I guess I, just viewing it as my mum because I see plenty of error there, but I yeah. see plenty of love there. And, and one thing I think which my mum has is faith. Yeah. And that, that, that integrity too. And, and, uh, and it's like a bit of an anchor in her life, yes. Nelly, you know, and, and that's what perhaps this lady's, you know, thing. And, and, and even though there's stuff there which is selfish or manipulative or whatever. She's desiring to be loving and she's wanting to be and keeps coming back to that, I think. Yeah. Which, if you think about it, aren't a lot of us in that same boat? <laughs> Except sometimes we ignore things like integrity, you know? We think, okay, I want to be more loving. I'm getting back on this horse. Oh, I realised that that wasn't, you know, here I go again. And we just come back to it and, yeah... Yeah, but if we can grow these qualities like faith and integrity, and I feel that this book demonstrates so many examples of people who are willing to stay true to principles and have integrity in the face of opposition. Like I see a lot of you go, oh, there's opposition, but I cried about this. Oh, that means all the teachings are out the window. You know, like this should be working better for me because we don't actually want to experience any discomfort. When we know that humility is all about experiencing discomfort and staying true, this self-abnegation is staying true to a set of principles above our desire to avoid discomfort. Yeah, yeah. If you pass next to you, Paul, yeah. Just adding on that, Mary, we often have this huge expectation that if we do all these things like you were talking about earlier, then suddenly we're going to be looked after yeah. And I just felt with her, she didn't have this expectation and then there was this beautiful surprise that comes yeah. later and it's yeah. like, you know, how cool is it with God? Like, when you just let go, then you're going to be surprised constantly, aren't you? Yeah. And, and also, I suppose, um, we can understand all these laws and how they work and we can see them in action in our life, just like Eloisa was saying earlier, wow, things actually go smoother when I feel. It doesn't mean her whole world is perfect but she's actually working in harmony with something instead of disharmony. In the chapter before this, we saw a woman who worked in complete disharmony with God, didn't we? She rebelled against everything. And she experienced not only a lot of pain in the spirit world, but in her earthly life. Now we're meeting another woman who doesn't, as you say, have this expectation and demand that she's looked after. But she does have qualities of integrity, faith, humility. You know, she's willing to choose love and, you know, have faith that that is the best course of action for her. We don't know how her life might have been if she had made another choice. But just lastly on what you said, Pete, this idea that we have an expectation that God, if we follow this set of dot points, God will look after me. Can you see that we're ignoring a really vital truth about God. And I think that connects back to when we were talking about love earlier. Like, I've had this huge expectation that if I'm loving, then God's going to look after me, basically. Yeah. 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 And we misunderstand love then, that love is actually a gift. God actually doesn't have to give us anything. It's a truth that he desires to. But while we have this feeling that I should be looked after... Well, God's not going to be able to work with that that very well because you, that's not open-hearted. That's not a sense of gratitude. That's not a space of humility. That's a demand. And God's going to be working with you until you release that demand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if we go um, back to Yvonne and forward to Matthew. Yeah. Where's the mic on that side? <laughs> Um, I think her driving force, she says it on the top of page 137, was that she had a really strong belief that God knows what's best. Thank you. And, and, and I don't have that yet. That it, it's a very small shift to start going from self-reliance to God-reliance, but then 
to actually go to a place where, and, and for her it was like fundamental, like God knows what's best, you know, God is great. And, and, so, and with that she had the belief that as long as she did her duty, eventually all would be well. Yeah. That's all she yeah. had to do. That's all she had to do. And that's that's faith in essence, isn't it? If I, if I, but I see a lot of people, and we've been talking about it a bit in Queensland with the group up there, where they go, "Gee, life is hard. It all hurts. Mm. Stuff you, God. I hate your system." Mm. Uh, instead of feeling like, "Wow, people have really hurt me," um, I, uh, people are more willing to check out on God and say, "God's the bastard," than say. People around me, are, there's been hurt in my life that I've caused people around me and that people around me have caused to me. So this, you know, I think if we could all get this principle that God is a good, God is loving, and whatever we're experiencing here, if we, it's a big way to avoid the pain of our experience here, is the, the real pain of our experience here, is to blame it all on God. And we end up alienating ourselves from God, who's the one who can help us heal the best. Um, but often I see people do it because they don't want to feel the pain with dad or they don't want to feel the pain in this, this relationship or they don't want to even just feel the pain of their sense of failure. They feel like, oh, I'm, fail, it's God, I'm failing, it's God's fault, you know, rather than feeling, wow, I, this really hurts. Uh, this is bringing up feelings about myself. Yeah, yeah. Seth? A um, couple of things. Um, I feel that, once we experience that love that God can give us, then we know that God is okay. You know, like no matter what what's happening to us on earth, from the people on earth, then I guess as you were saying, if your relationship with God is growing, yeah. then you can withstand more and more. And I also feel that unless we're able to withstand, unless I'm able to withstand... Um, greater and greater challenges, then I may, I probably won't last on the path because this is just the beginning. But as things expand and, you know, the poo hits the fan, <laughs> um, then it's going to be who's going to be left. Yeah. And because this is uh, what I feel, this is just the beginning. Um, I agree, Seth. It's yeah. like, wow, get ready. This yeah. is nothing yeah. yet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that really so has how struck much, me how much do I believe that God is good how much do I believe that if I keep choosing love if I keep choosing truth how much faith do I have that that is you know how much am I willing to face everyone around me telling me that that is wrong that's that's when our relationship with God begins to grow I agree yeah, yeah. I'm finding that um I'm getting rewarded all the risks that I'm taking with people, um, you know, not on the path, if you can say that. Yeah. Um, at the moment, it's just encouraging, encouraging, encouraging. But um, I'm also starting to hear through people that I'm meeting uh, stories of their experience, which shows me what could be in store Yeah. about their experiences with people and what I'm now seeing is very likely going to be my experience in the future as I encounter those sort of people. Yeah, or it may if not you see be. What I you mean. know, we don't need to build ourselves up for some big fearful confrontation because, you know, I do believe that if we practice humility, then things will go smoother for us. Mm. Um, but it is true, truth and error do clash. <laughs> and mm. if we want to honour truth, we will clash with error. It's going to happen. Mm. And in, I suppose what I'm working on is getting to the point where I relish that, where I think, yeah, this is an opportunity to show truth, to, um, to expose error, and that's a gift. I still kind of feel like, <gasps> here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, was, I had such a nightmare story yesterday about this community that we're in. Yeah. And... And I started to feel all of that fear. And then oh, not long ago, I think maybe just before the meeting or on the way here, I suddenly got a picture of how I could deal with that situation and it was like, oh, yeah, that wasn't from fear, that was from love. Yeah. That could be how it would go. Yeah. So, 
yeah. it was just really scary for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm going to get eaten up <laughs> and killed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I suppose that um, embracing that fear, you then got the gift of <laughs> understanding yeah, how goodness. to deal with it lovingly. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, Yvonne and then Karina. Yeah. Um, I, <clears throat> I like the way I've heard Jesus talk about his logic in terms of deciding that God is great, yeah. in terms of, well, I've got this much knowledge, but therefore God created also, he's got this much, and I've got this much love, and therefore God created me, and he, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like he, t- he went through a logical process to decide just how magnificent and enormous and, um, and great God really is. Yeah, and that, <clears throat> that logical process can help you to take a step in trust, And when you take that step, faith can build and, you know, but it's going to be a process for all of us, you know, all of us are blocking God's love right now because we don't actually trust it yet, you know, but the more we challenge these things, these fears, the more it will become a knowledge, but we can use logic to help us grow in that way. Anyway, there's a few more points from the chapter that, uh, what time is it, guys? Are you, does anyone know? One and a half? Yeah, yeah. So I just want to um, cover the last few points that are here in the chapter, unless anyone else has anything burning from what we've been talking about. Matthew? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, what really s- what struck me is like it's so easy to look at an example like this woman now that we've got on the board and say, oh, you know, I could... I, it's so hard for me to be like that because of the environment that I grew up in and the damage that I've got. And... I just don't think that's the case at all. Neither actually. do I. Yeah, yeah I, I feel like, um, y- yes, I've got those, that damage and stuff, but that I can still exercise my will in spite of the damage that I've got to have integrity. That is self-abnegation. Yes, exactly. Mm. And that is integrity. And that's why I think I resisted putting love on the board as Karina was like, oh, I love there. Because as Paul pointed out, maybe this woman isn't overflowing with love, but she has made choices that are in harmony with love Mm. and truth. And that has helped her soul condition. And um, I feel it's such an important point to for all of us to begin thinking and feeling about yes we can know we have all this damage but the minute we start using it as an excuse for badness to act badly or unlovingly Mm. there's hardly any point even knowing about it you know the only reason we want to uncover it is to heal it and we can and must make choices in harmony with love if we are going to heal otherwise we have a big cry so what if we just keep acting unlovingly to everyone Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I feel that like so many of us on the path are wanting to complain about our injuries in order as that as a big excuse yeah. for us for our unloving acts instead of going, you know what? My my unloving mother didn't pull the trigger, I pulled the trigger. Exactly. Later on in my life. Exactly. There were, she couldn't go, oh, something's going on. I better ring up Matt and be like, <laughs> don't pull that trigger, don't pull <laughs> yeah, that trigger. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. my fault that you feel like you want to. Yeah. So, so what? Yeah. yeah. Like, exactly. it's me exercising my will, my desire, yeah. and eventually for a, like, yeah, there's some portion of responsibility in terms of my environment that created those feelings inside of me. But what I really got from Maria and also from this lady is like the lion's share of the responsibility rests with myself and my choices. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love love what you just said. This woman didn't choose excuses, did she? She made no excuses. She knew something about love and she acted in, in harmony with it. Yeah. And the only point in knowing anything about the pain that we have is so that we can take responsibility for it. If we use it as an excuse, then then there's not a lot of point, really, is there? It, it actually yeah. degrades our soul condition. And, and she had this injury, just like so many other women, of, of uh, I'm not going to have security and I need a man to give me security and stuff like that. But she didn't let those fears dictate her life and be like, ah, oh, get a job. Oh, <laughs> yeah. like, how much more am I going to have to wait? You what I've been doing here all day, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she, she actually took personal responsibility for those feelings inside of her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why I felt she was such a beautiful example because, mm. yeah, she hasn't entered. She, remember, she hasn't even entered into the second sphere. She's just at the top of the first sphere right now, you know, and that's, that's the level of integrity she had to do that. 
Uh, Although she did fly off with her family afterwards up to wherever yeah, she was going to go, yeah, so perhaps, that might have been the Yeah, order. perhaps she was in a bit better condition, you're right. But, but um, it, yeah, she certainly wasn't at one with God or in some amazing, you know, bearer of truth while on the earth, but she stayed true to the truth that she did know, yeah. Uh, Laura? I think I just received a truth. <laughs> from you, what you were saying, because last week in the book group I was saying about how to separate um, God's perception of me versus my parents' perception of me and how they're so meshed. Yeah. And when you were describing that, it was like the more of a victim I am to the injuries that my parents hold, the more I'm actually h- holding myself back to um, for their approval of not to take the risk to step out and do something that they would disapprove of. Absolutely. So the more I say that was my injury, that was what they wanted, but now I'm going to make my own will and make my own decisions and take steps that they won't approve on, but it is more in harmony with love and truth. The more I feel like when you're doing it, I could just see my parents disappearing in terms of the power that they hold over me and stepping into a place of myself, my own personality and a deeper relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing. This is the thing that we have to act in disharmony with the error in order for it to leave us. We have to say, I've been told I'm worthless all my life, but I think there's another truth. I am actually worth something. I'm going to act in harmony with that and let the error leave me. And this is why I keep stressing the importance of action in humility, because there is a large, that is a large part of it. You know, I have to act I have to act to challenge the error, otherwise it can't leave me. And you're very right, we give people power over us when we keep telling ourselves the same negative messages that they've told us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, did you have your hand up, Mel? If you pass back, yeah. I was just going to make a comment on something that um, Angelo said to me once in relation to talking about my soul. Um, and just with the words that have been flown around in relation to injuries and damages and yep. and putting power onto these sort of words. And it's actually my soul's experiences. Yeah. And it sort of lessens the fear that we create ourselves by holding on to, oh, I've been damaged in my injuries. And so yep. for me, it just gives all that power to fear as yes. opposed to actually, this is my soul's experience and my faith in God, I know I can, you know look at this yeah yeah it's a very nice smell like we just bring it all the way back to ourselves we get all out there with all the language and the process and all of that but if we bring it all the way back to ourselves choose i'm going to have integrity to what i believe is true i'm going to act in love and my experience has been you know sometimes painful sometimes pleasurable i'm going to keep having an experience and just allow whatever was in the past of that experience to leave me, the errors from that experience to leave me and the truths to grow. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. Yvonne, and then we have to move on to the next lesson. Um, oh, it is moving on in a way. It's something yep. that we didn't cover. Um, it really struck me this morning, it, just after they talk about the religion of love yeah, and then they go on to paint a picture of what the world could look like in the future. Yeah. and um, And it struck me that, and, and really saying that it's not as far away as we think. And, um, and I really got a sense of that this morning, and especially after the, uh, the interview yesterday, thinking, you know, some of these things could be much closer than we think. And, and instead of judging the world and judging the systems and all the things that are wrong in the universe, um, if I thought if I start to develop the desire that I want to see the world differently, that I want to see the whole world open up in love... And what can happen in religion and politics and education and all of those things. And, and if a group of us start to hold those desires, um, Jesus was just saying the other day, we have no idea the power of our souls. And if, if a group of us actually really believed and held in our heart, because uh, that's the ultimate of love. You were just saying we want to we act against the injuries. We'll act against the injuries of the world. Mm-hmm. And which is what you guys have come back here for and so you're holding that vision and I'm thinking if we can start to hold that vision too yeah that's the way it'll it'll start 
Absolutely, I agree. And you know, on the weekend when I was talking to everyone about, so what's God's vision for the world? And everyone was like, yeah, 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 it's this, this. And I said, I just said, what stands in the way of that happening? And everyone went, ooh. <laughs> because, but I didn't feel it was like such a downer question. It's in your hands. It's that simple. Just start acting in, in integrity with the truths that you know. It can change. It really can. But everyone obviously feels a bit like heavy about that choice. But I think what Mel has just said that Angelo relayed to her, you know, it's, it is your life experience. We're making choices every day in one direction. We can make a different set of choices in another direction and it will make an impact on the world. Just as you say, yeah. yeah. Dave? Just to add to that, like in the religion of, of love, um, they say there that, but in every heart there is a latent ideal to which, towards which all mankind is blindly reaching out. Yeah, yeah. So it's there within us. Yeah, buried. Yes, very truths. Beautiful truths. Okay, I, I would love to, I think we're nearly out of time, but there's a, there's a huge lesson at the end of this chapter that I'd love to cover. So, um, who can guess what it is? <laughs> Eloisa? <laughs> oh, what happens at the end of the chapter? Who do we meet? Yep, yep. If we pass back to Eloisa. Show my little freak out. Um, it's a contrasting story of another woman. Yes. Who, and I thought it was just a beautiful contrast of love, of of one sort of more pure love and then um, of the love that basically pulls and demands and draws back. Um, and should I just relay the story just a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She, um, th there's another woman waking up and there's some um, little threads, violets sort of, they remind me of varicose veins actually, yeah. um, leading out into the ether. And as the woman wakes up, um, there's just this sort of pull on her to go back to earth and um, Afra asks why, why and wants to go back and see her and then that's the next chapter. But yep. Yeah, but yeah. he does say some very pressing words upon us at the end of this chapter. Um, Seth? About how important it is for us to feel our grief when a loved one dies so that we don't be pulling them back to earth and postponing their happiness. Yeah, yeah. And disturbing their rest. Disturbing their rest. So... So what did you guys feel about that? Matt? Well, for myself, I felt like I've got some of those with my dad. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's been around me for a really long time. Yep. And, he, and if I still haven't really grieved losing him yeah. in my life. Um, yep. But if I do grieve more... I really genuinely grieve that it's going to give him some more freedom to experience, to begin to explore more rather than feel like, oh, I better not go anywhere in case Matt can't, can't cope and needs me. Yeah. Like yeah. to give him some more freedom as well so then he can go and be like, well, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, uh, yep, Laura? You guys got the issue that he's actually talking about grieving, isn't he? He calls it love chords. Can we say it's love chords? No, love cords that are binding people to the earth. So, yep. Um, he also says their, our loss is their gain. And um, for me, it's what was written on the board, like those qualities of self-abnegation. Abnegation, yeah. And, and faith. And, he, and even though you know that, how can that be? Because he's going to go to the hells, because I know this man's a murderer. It's not yep. a gain. Yeah. But still having that faith that it actually is a gain, because every provision is of love and goodness given by God. So there is no grief even of the grief that they're going to be in a really dark space, which I have had. Yep. So it's still knowing that every location in the spirit world is of love and that there is always going to be lessons of love for them for to the, learn. For them to learn, yep, yep. We pass back to Teresa. Um, it also showed to me how much the relationships we have with everybody are addictive and that it's it's we're grieving the loss of our getting our addictions met more than our love for them and their progress and 
Yeah. yeah, this is a very important thing that's demonstrated here, isn't it? So, uh, as you're saying, Teresa, that often when a person dies, are we really cry- what are we really crying about? Yeah. A- us. Us. Our what own we loss. want from them. Yeah. 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 Alexis? Um, it also points out to me the contrast between the two. Um, and this is a great example, I feel, of where we just can't like have these rote understandings of, of any path, no. including this one, is they both self-abnegated. Yes. But one did it out of a love for truth and integrity. And probably the other one, I'm guessing, did it out of this, this feeling like she had to meet the demands of others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and interestingly, what is it that's drawing her back to the earth? Well, just that exactly, those very demands. The very know, demands, you know, yeah. Which is the unloving element of, of you know, her self-abnegation, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so we've been talking, haven't we, about this very pure form of self-abnegation, whereas we're seeing someone who's really denied themselves in favour of other people's demands in this second example, aren't we? Yeah. Seth? I've got a couple of questions. Yep. Um, does that mean that... I, th- I thought it was saying that uh, if people on earth are grieving for you in that way, that you can't help but be pulled back to earth. Okay. And that's first, and then there's another one. Yeah. So let's clarify that. Because we, the way it's described is a lot in terms of love, isn't it? And I think that we, you know, for the purposes of people watching, I think you guys have all kind of understood that... Um, Fred and Kushna are making an example of the fact that they're saying it's love, but it's, it's really spoken in a loose way about love, isn't it? This is not the love that we understand because that love doesn't really make demands on people. But Fred is saying, you guys, if only I could tell you, don't do this thing where you keep pulling people back to earth. It's love and he's saying love, but that doesn't fit well with us now. But he's saying... You know, it's pulling people back to earth. So I was going to ask all of you, what are the things that pull people back to earth? What are the false beliefs inside of us that pull people back to earth? Because that, I think that's really the answer to your question. It's not about... Does true love ever make a demand? No. No. Um, I was... It sounded to me like she was at the mercy. If, if once you die, that you're sort of at the mercy of these people on earth dragging on you. So but maybe not. Maybe it was what you discussed before about her being too giving to others or taking notice of others' feelings before her own, not being self-loving. Well, if you reflect on it, Cess, what what would make her like that? From your understanding of the human soul, what would mean that she would be drawn back to the earth? I guess if she's in addiction with those people. Yes, yeah. So there's a soul... There's a soul and soul interaction happening. There's more than just her, the people on earth souls. They've got these, these false beliefs and emotions that would be good for all of us to talk about. But she's also got the corresponding injury that would make her respond to that. So that's what we're seeing a demonstration of here. Mm. So obviously she has the will to be able to heal those things. And I believe all her friends in the spirit world are trying to help her to do that. But at the moment, just like Marie we saw in the other chapter was just drawn back by her own soul condition, this woman is also being drawn back by her soul condition. Mm. It, does that, is that yeah, clear? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Then I would like to talk to all of you guys. I know we're running out of time, but just to wrap up the chapter... What are the false beliefs and injuries that would call people back to earth, Matthew? Um, do you mean the, 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 the feelings inside of the person that have died or the, no, pers- the people left on earth? No, inside of us, yeah. Yeah, that I won't be okay without you. Yeah, so Just what is that, uh, if we could... Like a, like, a, like a neediness and a dependence on another person. Yep, so neediness. Yeah. Yeah, if you pass back to Mel... I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> ah, okay. P? The whole concept of death. So this separation that once you die, then you no longer, you're apart. Yeah, so it's, it's a lack of truth, isn't it, within us? An avoidance of the truth that a person continues living. Yeah. Yep. Yep, so avoidance of truth about 
the spirit world, if we say, or the human soul? What else? What other emotions or beliefs might we have that would call people back? Miriam? I think there would be some to do with a false concept of love, particularly probably um, a parent losing a child or something like that, that, you know, uh, if you were really loving, you'd never recover from it. That, yes. That it would be loving to always grieve. Yes, yeah. You know? So a feeling that I show my love for someone through my agonies at not having them. So yeah. false beliefs about love, yep, yep. yep. Uh, what else? What are the other feelings that sometimes people have when uh, people pass? Anger. Anger. Anger and demand. I don't want to live without you. This is not fair. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to grieve about this. Yep. Anything else you guys can think of? Yep, Dave. That something wasn't right between us before they passed and, and I won't be able to make good on it kind of thing? Yeah, yep. Like guilt? Guilt, yep. And all of these things, what are all of these things indicative of? What are we actually avoiding? Humility. Humility. Truly grieving, aren't we? When we truly grieve, we're willing to grieve all the, the things that they're not fulfilling for us anymore and let go. And then, the, then those, those purple cords that Eloisa described wouldn't be pulling on them anymore from our end. Yeah. Matthew? I think when someone dies, like especially if we're in addiction with them, there's a whole lot of stuff that gets exposed inside of us then. Yes. And so we can be in a real shock about that and then hopefully just try and kick along until someone else comes along into our life. And then, But that whole time we might have been really unloving to the person who's just passed Yeah. and not wanting to deal with any of those feelings that have been exposed and just maybe someone might come along who can be a bit of a substitute now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I agree. That addiction is the main thing that pulls people back to us when we, we want them to fulfil this addiction. And even like sadly, uh, Miriam talked about when a child dies, often parents are just not wanting to let go of all this image of themselves as a parent, what a good parent would do, what this child was going to fulfil in me, all of those kinds of things that they supposedly grieving but it's very little actually about the child or the person who's passed. Yeah. I feel like people are like a lot of the time totally dumbstruck, like dumbstruck by it almost that they thought things were going to go along okay and then suddenly it's like the carpet's well, gone out from under their feet and they're like, oh, it's all in my face, it's all real, this is too much. Yeah. And if you consider this, if, so we're seeing a depiction, aren't we, of a spirit-based inter, interaction that is happening between someone who's passed and people on earth who want that person to continue meeting their addictions. What do you think it looks like when you break up a relationship? Karina? Um, yes, I was feeling that when I read this, um, that I've done this to people on earth when I've broken up, we've broken up in a relationship and I've hung on to them and, and been needy and all of those things. Yep. And I know now that they would feel that yeah. and that it's extremely unloving. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a great thing for us to consider. We're being shown a depiction of like a spirit life example, but actually we know these things are coming out of us towards other people. And when we truly grieve, that wouldn't happen. But while we're stuck in all this neediness, demand, or often I see people when relationships end are crying and crying and crying, but they're really just crying about their addiction not getting met. And all the while that that's happening, what's coming out of us? Come back. You've got to come back, come back, come back. And that person is going to be feeling that. And often, you know, if they have a corresponding injury, that, the, yep, you get back together. It's wonderful. <laughs> Just go back to Peter. <laughs> I think there's another bit too around the whole loss and loneliness. Yep. So we have a big thing so about the loneliness that we've been left alone. Yeah, we don't want to feel alone, we? don't want to do feel we? how alone we are. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we want... We become needy just to avoid that, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Karina? Um, I actually had a question yep. about babies. Yes. Um, now, I've seen parents, um, when a baby dies, 
just losing the plot and just going, Ape, you know, really doing this to the max. And I'm, my question is, um, this lady was drawn back by it with her f belief systems, but would the celestial spirits just take that baby to Summerland and and that baby wouldn't have to go through that, that soul damage or what would happen? Okay, what do you guys think? Pete? I think the baby's going to be drawn back to us. I believe that there's a lot of um, concerted effort from the spirit world to assist that baby not to be drawn back by the parent's emotions. You know, so there's a lot of concerted effort to have the baby sleep for a long time, to, to try to, and I think we see that later on in the book, trying to, and even actually in this chapter it talks about people being, you know, kept in a sleep for a long time so that these so that people might, on earth might work through some of these things and not be drawing on them all the time. But I think it, it's a very um, unfortunate, sad truth of what does happen when um, babies pass and children pass is often they are drawn back to, to the families because of um, the, the unwillingness to let go. But, but equally, when a child is very, very small, there is a lot of effort placed into trying to help them have a distance from that from that emotionally yeah david just in that like in the case before us messengers had been continually dispatched it's like so there's obviously help available to people on earth there's so much help available to us yes. but we're ignorant or we choose not to, to yeah. access it yeah as we hear in the chapter there's so much concerted effort trying to help all these people on earth and trying to help this woman to just break this thing that's going to keep each of them bound in a lower condition but it's whether either party displays humility opens up to that if you think about it, a lot of people have this experience, don't they, after someone that, who is close to them passes, they have a sign that shows, oh, they're still alive. They have this moment where they go, oh, death isn't real. I, I understand, you know. And that's part, I believe, of our celestial friends trying to show people truth. It's okay, you know, you, you can let go of this feeling that you're holding on to about them, you know, being lost to you forever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Yvonne? Um, I just thought the whole description of everything that happened in Siamese's house <clears throat> was a demonstration of love as we were talking about the religion of love. Yes. And that um, it made me cry actually through the whole five or six pages because it was everything. It was like, it was like love was the most important thing in the universe and, uh -huh. and nothing else mattered except the loving attention that was given. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, and I suppose we, we're shown again and again in this book, aren't we, just the level of God's love for each of us, the provisions he has to bring us back to love, to help us grow, to help us heal. And um, we talked last week about how much we interfere with that process, don't we? Through the use of our will, you know, we even distract the nature that could have healing properties because we want dominance and self-reliance. Um, but, yeah, I feel that... Um, it's beautiful if we can take this message into our hearts that, wow, that is a demonstration of just how much love God does have for me right now, wherever I am. Yeah. Says? Mary, where it says, let the loved ones rest in peace upon the bosom of their God, mm -hmm. I'm just, it sounds like everyone gets to have some beautiful experience, but. It's not always the case, is it? Because, like, it sounds like there's so much love for everyone once they pass over, but um, is that only if you're open to feeling that love? Because some people are suffering horrifically, aren't they? They are. What do we know about the receipt of love? How can we receive love? <laughs> Humility. Yeah, we have to be open to it, don't we? So there is love available for every single person who passes, for every single one of us right now. But we have to be open to it. And I believe that when everyone passes, everything is designed to help them get to a place where they will open to it. 
You know, we saw with Marie, she'd used her will in like rah, opposition to everything that God had put in place and every bit of love that she knew. And she was, you know, she was kicking and screaming her way until she eventually found a place where she went, mm. I submit to this. And suddenly, there's love inherent in every blade of grass around her and people are there, you know, ministering to her, taking time with her, everything then. As soon as she altered that will... Everything was there to demonstrate that love. 40 years in her case. Yeah, yeah. How many of us have uh, waited <laughs> a long time to change our will to, to be in harmony with God's and to feel that love for us? Lots of us feel like we're doing it alone for a long time and nobody cares and the world's a cold place. Um, and then we often have this moment where we realise, oh... God's there and loves us and suddenly we begin to understand those things like Eloisa was saying at the beginning. Yeah. Anyway, guys, there's another, there's another event happening hereafter, so we need to wrap up. Thank you so much. It's been really a joy to be back in Kentucky with all of you guys and, um, uh, yeah, look forward to... I'm sure I'll see you again for another chapter. <laughs>